Hey, good afternoon to you. Mark Southern Hurricane Track here. Tuesday now, the 2nd of September, 2025. Great to be with you on this fine afternoon with a lot to talk about. The main topic next up is Gabrielle in the Atlantic. And I do think we're going to have that sooner rather than later. And yes, there are some concerns that this could impact our friends in the islands first. I will present the evidence of such concerns as we progress through today's update. But I want to start off, and we'll just get started immediately here, with a look at the Eastern Pacific, because we do have a couple systems, one of which gives me some uh, concern for our friends here in the southwest U.S. We'll get to that in a second. First, though, we do have Kiko out here, and it'll be moving on off to the west and west-northwest with time. And uh, could get pretty strong out there, but it will not, it looks like, affect Hawaii directly. So no worries from that system, generally speaking. The other one, though, that we do have to keep an eye on here is Lorena. This formed this morning, well on its way to strengthening, probably going to be a hurricane. First landfall will be up here somewhere along the central Baja, crossing the Gulf of California into the Sonora area of northwest Mexico. And then the remnant moisture... Let's use that green color for moisture. After all, that's what it looks like on a lot of the global models, right? A lot of extra moisture is going to make its way up into this part of the southwest, and that could bring some flooding concerns. So we need to watch this over the coming days and see how this progresses and how much of that moisture will make it up there and uh, everything that that implies. Uh, big concerns, especially near Ruidoso, They've been flooded a lot already this year, last year as well, maybe southeastern Arizona. So don't ignore this. This could be a problem with that I word, impacts, and in this case, the R word, rain, heavy rain at that. So that is something we'll be watching over the coming days. Here's what it all looks like on the satellite animation. There's Lorena. There's Kiko sitting out here. Some disturbed weather sitting around Florida still. Pretty good pressure gradient of high pressure to the north. Low pressure to the south, so you get some stiff winds coming in. And a little bit of convergence down there. You see a few showers and thunderstorms. They're all scattered about. But nothing that's concentrating just yet. Um, I do want to show you, though, this real quick related to Lorena. And I want to draw your attention to the Baja right here. And then this area of the southwest United States. Move the GFS. This is the 12Z run through time. There comes all that green. That is your basically mid-level humidity value, so a lot of extra moisture coming up into the southwest U.S. This would be southeastern Arizona right in here, right? And then you have New Mexico, and uh, Ruidoso is located somewhere in that circle. And that is a concern because extra deep tropical moisture could bring a lot of rainfall, especially with orographic lift. There are mountains up there. I've been there. Went there a few weeks ago. Finally got to see it. So yes, this is a concern, and we will be watching this closely, and I will talk about it in each subsequent update throughout the rest of the week. Now, moving to the east a little bit, maybe even a lot. Here is our system, not yet an invest area, but when it does get designated, assuming that nothing else beats us to it, it will be, say it with me now, 91L, L for Atlantic, 91L. Fernon was 90L. And you start over, 90 through 99 are the numbering systems, classification system, whatever you want to call it. And we will be back to 91L. It's got a pretty good area of general rotation right now. Lots of energy sitting out here. Favorable environment overall. And the National Hurricane Center does give this 70% probabilities of developing into a depression or more over the next seven days. And we're going to have to watch this for our friends over here in the Northeast Caribbean, including Puerto Rico, because the pattern up in the steering layers of the atmosphere over the tropical Atlantic and the subtropical Atlantic will be such that this might not gain a whole lot of latitude. It doesn't look like it's going to do this. I don't think that's in the cards. And we're going to have to watch this because every situation is different. You can't just lock it in and say, oh, it's going to do just like Aaron did, and that's that. That is foolish, just like looking at one run where something plows through a bunch of land masses. Remember, early on in the game, we saw Aaron doing that on especially the GFS as an example. Long-range models are just noise from the future. All right, They are showing us something in the future. It's extra noise. It doesn't hold a lot of value. 
way out in time, beyond, I don't know, five to seven days, and certainly not 10, 12, 15 days. Interesting to look at, not helpful in the long run, so just keep all that in mind, all right? So there's the incipient feature. Lots of people talking about it. Here's the NHC's TAF B. I love this annotation. It's so neat to be able to see all this on the satellite imagery. There's your monsoon trough snaking its way through Africa, out into the Atlantic, and then it becomes the intertropical convergent zone. So lots of air coming together through here, a lot of humidity, low-level moisture, latent heat ready to be released from the tropical Atlantic. But there is some dry air, as noted by little stratocumulus clouds up here. Um, so it's not, you know, organizing quickly, but we do have a seedling. Of course we do. And that is why the probabilities have done nothing but go up over the recent uh, past here, right? So let's look at it from the perspective of a couple of the computer models here. These are the deterministic models. And then I'm going to, then I'm going to show you an interesting post here from our good friend Michael Lowry, who is on top of this stuff. And uh, I think you'll really get it why we have to watch this closely over the coming days first for our friends in the Northeast Caribbean. So let's drop me out because I'm not the star of the show. We need to show you the tropics here, right? So let's use blue because that pops better. Uh, 850 millibars, you know the drill by now if you've been watching my videos for any length of time. I like this layer of the atmosphere because it shows me the framework from which everything else seems to come from. By the way, there's our broad area of low pressure vorticity signature down there off of Florida, north of the Bahamas. But this is our little piece of energy sitting out there along the monsoon trough, draped southwestward like that. I just showed you from the TAF B graphic. So let's move all of this into motion, shall we? We shall. So this is 24 hours out. And uh, the main thing I want you to watch really is how this comes together, all right? And then you got your big subtropical ridge sitting up here. Looks like a big old fried egg, doesn't it? I think it does. But anyway, moving on along. 48 hours out, GFS says, hey, we're going we're gonna to be off to the races here and get this thing curled up and, and going. Three days out, same thing. It's really starting to come together uh, within a very favorable environment. And then notice to the north, this big sprawling area of high pressure, big mountain of air, keeping this generally moving off to the west and west-northwest through the time period. Speaking of that, there's four days and then five days, six days, kind of starts to turn to the west as the ridge strengthens. And finally, by seven days, a week out, fully formed hurricane in the model, south of a pretty stout ridge of high pressure. What could go wrong, right? Well, we know in terms of steering patterns and everything else that the atmosphere is constantly changing. This doesn't just sit there like that. Everything moves around, big chess pieces on a big chess board. So where this ends up a week you know, and beyond, seven, eight, nine, ten days plus, nobody knows the answer to that, no matter what you hear or see on the Internet. We just don't know. And just using the GFS here to start driving my point home about how these models can change, and this is just the deterministic stuff. We're not even talking yet about ensembles, which I'll show you over on this tab up there. See, I'm highlighting it for you. The Michael Lowry tab, we'll get to that. So this is the 12Z run. This is what it looked like way back on the 6Z run and then the 0Z run, all right? So just progressing forward, the trend south and west and stronger. So you see, you can go back a few cycles and at the same time period, gosh, I love that Dr. Cowan has baked this into the interface here. You can get those trends. So it is trending more south and more west as the ridge to the north is stronger. And that is the clue here, obviously. So what does the old Euro show? It typically does a really good job at picking out these bigger puzzle pieces of the atmosphere and then it tries to handle the smaller ones, like little tropical areas like that. That's the disturbance off Florida. And then here is our soon-to-be, and it won't be long, probably, 91L. And eventually, I think it will be Gabrielle. So let's see what the Euro shows. So this is the 12Z run as well, same part of the atmosphere, 850 millibars up, so about 5,000 feet. This gives us 24-hour increments, so there's 24, 48, 72. It starts to organize. 
day four, five, six, seven, and we'll stop at that. And I know you could look at the whole thing yourself, and there's sites that'll, and eventually the Euro, like up here, this ECMWF deal on Levi's site, it'll take you out to 360, but who cares? I'm telling you, trust me, and you guys know this, noise from the future. It's just extra, oh, it's going here, going there, maybe it's out to sea. Ignore it. Uh, it's just not, it, there's no skill. A 360-hour forecast. Let's stop it at a week and see where it is positioned. And we can also do the whole, how has the euro been trending? Now, this is really interesting here. This is the current run. Let's slide me over here. And uh, luckily, I didn't fall out of my chair when we did that. Wouldn't that be funny if there was actual physics? Anyway, someday, right? In some weird VR world. Um, so this is the 12Z run from today. What about the 12Z run yesterday? Comparing just 24 hours out, did you see it? I mean, look, that is quite a difference even on the euro, which does a pretty good job of this. I guess we can move me back. I just want to make sure I have my times right. So this is today's run. This is yesterday's run, same time frame, 24 hours prior. So definitely a little weaker today and more south and west for sure. So that is something we're going to have to be watching because it's not going to take much more adjusting if this ridge is stronger. I mean, you know, the drill, this could come right in through the islands there. So don't, don't ignore it, but don't worry about it. That's the whole point of all this. Just make you aware, again, with all the other things going on in our daily lives. And you guys have the internet down there. Of course you do. And you're watching all kinds of stuff. So just keeping you up to date on what I'm seeing as well as my colleagues in the field. What are they seeing? And this is interesting, too. Now, this is several hours ago, but I think it's even more, um, what is the word, apropos for now or whatever. It's uh, more relevant than ever because of today's trends. Uh, Michael Lowry posted this at 9.01 this morning, way back just a few hours ago. In the weather world and on social media world, 9 a.m., so seven hours ago roughly, that's a long time. But anyway, he is talking about exactly what I just discussed with you. And uh, that's these different ensembles here. Of course, I showed you the deterministic. But look, the GFS generally is uh, on a northwesterly trajectory. Now, these are, of course, from the 0Z run last night, right? This is all valid out at September 10th. The Euro ensembles were more flat with an implied threat with some of the ensemble members towards the islands. And this is what the deterministic has really zoomed in on today. And then you've got the Google Deep Mind. And that is even more flat and even more south uh, towards the islands, probably weaker overall. That's hard to say. But you can see the conundrum here. We don't know. You know, GFS and its ensembles uh, definitely suggesting avoiding land. This has a few members that doesn't. And this is like, uh-oh. So we're going to have to watch this clearly. I mean, again, I said this the other day and a couple people chuckled about it. Uh, sometimes I do feel like memos from Mark's Department of the Obvious, but we're in the peak of hurricane season. We're coming up on it. Fully expect there to be activity out there. We know all of this, but the remember I've been doing this, what we don't know versus what we don't know, shtick thing. We don't know where these are going to end up. You know, we just have to watch Every day, see how things change. Most hurricanes don't hit the United States. That's the given here, right? Because if they all hit the United States, nobody would live, or elsewhere, nobody would live at the coast. So yes, most of them do turn out to sea. Uh, but it's early in the evolution of this system, and we will be on top of it. Now, one thing I want to show you before I let you go, because I like getting questions from people, either on email, people still use email, through YouTube comments and even on our Patreon. And I had one such question from one of our supporters, a gentleman named Chuck. And he was asking me about the drop sond that the hurricane hunters use to measure, in the case of his specific question, wind speeds near or at the surface. So I thought that I would show you a quick little part here, about uh, 15 seconds or so of this video. I'll put a link to the video itself in today's update because it's about a year old and it's really fascinating just to get everybody on the same page of what a drop sign what and then I'm gonna explain because uh, I thought it was kind of complicated 
And I realized, oh, it's actually very easy as to how these drop signs measure wind data because they don't have a propeller on there. I'll get to it. So let me get the video volume up here so we can hear this through my speakers. Drop me out of the frame. And let's hear from Dr. Joseph Sion about drop signs. Turn my volume up. Now is P3. Here we have what's known as a drop sign. This gets deployed from NOAA's P-3 and jet aircraft. And once it gets deployed, you have this parachute which slows it down and stabilizes it. All right, so that's where I'm going to stop it. Why? Why did you stop it? Because this is the part I want to explain. Because he's going to go on and explain the other drop signs that they've got, including a new one that they're testing. Again, that's why I want to put a link to this video in today's description, because the future is amazing. So that is the typical drop sign. It comes down through parachute and it gets stabilized and it floats through the atmosphere and it sends back temperature, humidity, dew point, and wind readings, pressure, all that good stuff. The key here, and this is the answer to Chuck's question, is the sample rate. How fast does it send back this data? And the answer is really interesting. Half a second. So it's not one second, it's not five seconds, it's not every minute. Some of the stuff we do in the field, we take a sample every minute of the wind and then we average it all out. You get a gust, an average, uh, an average wind, and then the peak gust. We do our stuff at one-minute intervals, and most wind speeds on land are either one, five, or ten-minute measuring. This thing sends data back every half second. Therefore, sophisticated computers on board the aircraft using GPS data are able to calculate the movement of that drop sign as it's falling and then you get an estimated wind. Now say estimated because you're not literally out there with a mechanical anemometer measuring the wind from those drop signs. So it's literally using math as it floats down and it gets bounced around and that is the big key here. It is the sample rate every half second. So great uh, question from you Chuck. I hope you understand it a little better. It's not a mechanical thing at all. It's just literally a formula. Um, and the computer handles it all on board and that gets transmitted back through what are called high definition observations or HDOBs and vortex messages and whatever else and we all see it on sites like Tropical Tidbits and others that have recon data. Fox Weather's done a really good job at translating that too where everybody can see it sometimes in near real time. So I'll put a link to that video. Dr. Sion there is a phenomenal scientist down at HRD and they're doing some terrific work and that leads me into ending today's video because eventually I do believe they're going to be dropping some of those songs and some of the newer ones which you'll learn about if you watch the video in future Gabrielle. See how I tied it all up there in a nice little box, put a bow on it and we're all done with today's update. All right, so we'll stay on top of that. We'll stay on top of what's happening with Lorena. I am concerned about that for our friends in the Southwest so we'll get back on it and we'll discuss it probably with a video tomorrow morning. All right. Yep, I'll be up early tomorrow. We'll get one out in the morning, go over the, uh, the overnight stuff. Until then, have a great rest of your Tuesday from all of us at Hurricane Track. Thanks for watching, and I'll have another one for you in the morning.